So, hello everyone, and thanks to Johanna and Gamer Place for having me today. Um, yeah, now we're going to discuss a little bit Rust for game development and if it even is useful and if it can compete with C++. So that one gets a little bit more techy. Um, before we start, I want to shortly introduce myself. We already heard I'm Lucas Vogel. I'm currently finished my master's degree in game engineering and simulation at the University of Applied Sciences Vienna. Um, now I'm working at Purple Lamp Studios as a junior programmer and I'm mostly interested in all the things with low-level programming, C++, Rust, game engines, and graphics programming, and Cats and Witcher. So, before we start with getting into detail a little bit more, um, what is Rust and why should we care? I want to ask you, does any one of you know, already know Rust? Okay, and do you already also use it? One? Yeah, nice. Okay, then to start, I could now say it's a new system level programming language. And, um, yeah, that would tell you what Rust is, but it would not, not tell you why we should care about a new system level programming language. We already have C, C++, so we should be good to go. But Rust is a little bit different because it comes with a promise of giving us performance, at least as C++ level, and safety, more than C++ level. How does it do this? Um, Rust has the approach of integrating static analysis directly into its compiler. Static analysis is helping you when you program to avoid common errors. Um, for that, Rust also introduced some language concepts which are checked by these rules. For example, lifetimes. A common problem in C++, done by novice programmers, also uh, intermediate and also expert programmers, is having problems with what has to live how long. So Rust helps you there. And I have a short sample later to show you how. We have immutability by default. That's a small one, but an important one, because we have to tell to the compiler what we are going to change, not as opposed to C++, that we have to mark what we don't want to change. Um, in a very superficial, superficial way, we can say we have no data races in Rust, because the compiler can check such things and tell you when you would have some multi-threaded problems in your code. But we also have a backdoor called unsafe code where we want to do low-level things and we want to tell the compiler, don't bother with what we're doing, we know what we're doing. But if you are in unsafe land and you do something wrong, then it blows up and you're on your own there. And it's even more awesome than that because Rust is built upon the LLVM framework, the low-level virtual machine. So it's a front-end and it already uses the optimizer there and the back-end. And that's awesome because using the backend there allows us to support many target architectures and even use cross compilation to get more target systems. That's awesome for game dev because we can, for example, use a Windows development machine and deploy for Android or even WebAssembly if you want to have a browser game and stuff like that. Um, so now a short example, um, very short example because we don't have that much time. Um, and it shows one of the cool things of Rust. We have up there in the first three lines, you see the struct called value wrapper, and in the angle brackets behind that, you see a weird thing, you maybe don't know, it's called the lifetime expression. Because in the struct, we have a reference. So in a very um, simple way, we can say we're borrowing some value there. But we want to tell that, we, that this value has to live at least as long as the struct. And that comes into play when we go into the main function and see in the first three lines we're good to go because we have a value here uh, defined with type inference, so it's a u int 30, uh, yeah, 32 bit integer, and we borrow it into a value wrapper. Then we can print it, so here we are just fine, compiler will go through all of this without any problems. Then we have another value wrapper, a mutable one. So when we want to mutate something, we have this mute keyword and have to annotate it. If we don't use it here, we are not allowed to change anything on this value of the initialization. And we open a new scope, and there it gets interesting because inside of this scope, we have a scope value, and now we borrow that one. And if we want to compile that piece of code now, the Rust compiler would jump into our faces, and it does good so because we have a problem here. Because after the scope ended, we would have a dangling reference or a pointer to their uninitialized garbage memory. And the compiler comes up with that one, 
and it really tells us that we have borrowed something here that is not that does not live long enough and that's a good thing in rust that the error messages are really helpful so you can do a thing I, I like to refer to it as you can do compiler driven development write your code compile it and the compiler will tell you what you have to change that it works so that a small example that you at least have seen some rust code before we go into rust in game development because in game development, we already have two uh, community engine projects, one of them called Piston. Piston has a modular approach, so it's more like a library collection that gives you all the things you need for doing a game. And it supports 2 and 3D rendering, even with different render backends, so you can switch between OpenGL, DirectX, and windowing systems. And you can even switch between C, C++ ones or ones pure written in Rust. And all of this is backed by a really good open source community that's also really helpful and tries to help you in doing games with the engines. The big competitor is Amethyst. That uh, goes a little bit different approach. It's a data-oriented engine. It has asset hot reloading and is also very um, focused on multi-threading. So we have multi-threaded asset hot reloading and a multi-threaded entity component system that's called Specs. You can also check that out if you are interested in two such things because it's a really cool implementation of that. And it's also capable of 2D, 3D rendering and has an open source community. But only having engines in the field of game development is, is cool because we can do games, but it will never move a language to, to the size of C++ and give it a place in the game engineering field that C++ has. To do so, we need studios to really use that language in production code. And one studio which does that is Chucklefish. I may, some of you know Stardew Valley, and that's their new game, it's called Witchbrook. And what they did with this game is awesome because they started to transfer all their code base from C++ to Rust and use Rust for all their upcoming projects. So the whole game is written in Rust and it has a scripting via Lua binding. So they also maintain this library for the best Lua bindings currently in the Rust ecosystem. And not being awesome enough, they also got it to run on three major consoles. They weren't allowed to talk about that because of console NDAs, but we can expect that one of them will be the Nintendo Switch because Stardew Valley had great sales there. So when this game comes out, we have a Rust game that will run on the Nintendo Switch, interfacing with the C++ console APIs, which is really awesome. It's a big step forward of getting the language into the, into the, into the industry. A second big player who uses Rust is EA with their Search for Extraordinary Experience division, which does ray tracing stuff and other research. And in some of their projects, they use Rust, for example, for some, they have some GRPG, uh, RPC implementations in Rust and other stuff. And what's cool in EA is that we can see that Rust already influenced the, the job offerings there, because now they're uh, not only searching for C++ developers, but Rust or C++ developers. So we also have a uh, step forward into getting jobs with that language in the industry. Um, now, beside all these te theoretical effects, um, I read about them and then I thought, okay, I have a master thesis to do. So let's check out how good Rust is really compared to C++. And I, for my topic, I did implement some engine modules in C++ and Rust, and later compared them performance-wise. So for the master thesis, I did a memory management, so having allocators and stuff like that, container library, and an entity component system. And I also wrote a benchmark application in Rust to make um, here, uh, reliable benchmarks with the same clock for all the things. So yeah, the results of this thesis were that in most cases, or in average, C++ still was about 15% faster, which is not that fast. So if we can justify the safety guarantees Rust brings us with the loss of the 15% of performance, then Rust would be a language really cool for such things. And we have to say that Rust has room for improvement because some of the features C++ has, which make it, makes it awesome for things like memory management, are currently not implemented in Rust, or were implemented and were removed during the master thesis, which was fun, because reworking whole memory management during the thesis was fun. 
Um, yeah, but if they, these things come in, I would expect that the number would lower to 10% or even under 10%, which is, which then would really be justifiable to change to the language. So yeah, and um, with that, I'm on the end of my task. Um, if you have any questions, maybe here or and free, I'm not sure. Better talk to Lucas yeah. outside because Perfect. we're on a tight schedule.